Welcome to my first meeting of 2018. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, in 2017, I had 115 public meetings like this one. You may have heard that some of these meetings became rather contentious. So I want to be sure to review the rules that all of these would adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask you all to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears in the science slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in Germantown or surrounding communities, and then if time permits, I will call on residents of the 5th Congressional District and other communities. If there is additional time available, I will call on those who do not reside in the 5th District. The first portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized as the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as we can within the time constraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We can all disagree without becoming disagreeable. Signs are okay in the room as long as they are neither disruptive or obstructive. The second portion of the meeting is devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they're experiencing with the federal government. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have one-on-one -on -one private conversations and it is not the time to continue discussions from the legal issues part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited during this part of the meeting. Uh, let me introduce State Representative Dan Noble, who represents the Germantown area of the State Assembly. He is here to listen to your comments and answer your questions about what's going on in Madison while I try to do the same on the federal issues. Finally, let me say I am getting over a cold that went into my ears. So I would ask all of you to kindly speak rather loudly uh, so that I can hear what you have to say. And excuse me if I ask you to repeat your question again if I didn't get it. So uh, without any further ado, the first one up is uh, Kevin Curtis, Hawthorne Drive in Germantown. Mr. Curtis. Hi, Jim. Um, you know, this is a kind of tough issue for me, so you have to give me a little bit. Um, last year, when you and fellow Republicans attacked the ACA, um, it hurt me, and it really hurt me and my family. Um, I was on the ACA at the time. I was paying my premium. I was getting help from the government in order to pay my premium. Without that, I, to make the, to get up to the point, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I had cancer twice when I was a child. Ever since the ACA came in place, I knew that I could get insurance. I knew because they no longer were restricted pre-existing conditions. I knew that they was always an option, an easy way for me to get an affordable healthcare plan. My meds are enough to cover most of my bill, most of my insurance bill. So hey, trying to take that away from me is a grave issue to me. And it really hurts me when you tell me that we're not going to hurt the individual mandate, which is already gone because of taxes, because of the new tax reform. We're not going to hurt pre-existing condition people because of the healthcare pool that while you say Wisconsin's worked well, it only worked for 22,000 people. It did not work for about a half a million people who have pre-existing conditions like me, whose premiums would have skyrocketed to exorbitant rates that no one could afford. It hurts me when you do that. It hurts people in your community who have issues already. The idea of insurance is for everyone to pull together to help out those who need help. The way you're doing it is hurting everyone. 
Well, I think the, the uh, ACA has been hurting a lot of people. When you look at how premiums have skyrocketed, you know, the president said you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan, and there'll be a $2,500 decrease in your premium, and none of those became true. Now, you know, what I can say is that every replacement plan that Republicans have proposed have always said that no one can be denied insurance because of pre-existing conditions. They're also in the Republican replacement plan that passed the House and failed in the Senate, a premium support program uh, for people who were poor. You know, not a subsidy, but a premium support program uh, that uh, uh, would have helped them buy insurance. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, the ACA, you know, has been a disaster. Right. Everybody's insurance premium is ballooned. I'm under Obamacare. I'm paying three times more than I did under the old federal employees, you know, health care program. You know, so, you know, this is even making members of Congress in the pocketbook. And you know, a lot of people said we exempted ourselves, and exactly the opposite has been true. You know, this was a bad mistake on the part of the president and those who supported it. You know, we've been trying to fix it. We haven't gotten any help from the other side. We're going to continue to try to fix it. Uh, and you know, I'm sorry that you feel the other way, but I ran on getting rid of uh, the ACA uh, for three elections. And I'm not going to break the promises that I made during the campaign to the constituents who voted for me. Every plan that I've seen that your party has put in place would hurt people who have pre existing conditions. Putting risk schools is far too dangerous. You're going to have many people who need health insurance, who need prescriptions on a daily basis, they will not have insurance. They will not be able to cover that once. I'm well enough off, and I can barely afford the payments that were there. They're going to balloon even more yeah. the way you're handling the ACA. Well, sir, I, you know, I'm one who rejects you know, the notion of the government does it better. You know, the government doesn't do it better. And you look at how the ACA has wrecked, you know, the insurance industry that has uh, uh, been available <laughs> to fairly well for most people, you know, before the ACA came up. We're going to have to agree to disagree on this. I made, you know, I made it plain during the campaign that I wanted to get rid of the ACA. I made that promise to the people of the fifth district, and I'm going to live by it. Well, I hope that means that we can get rid of you then too. Yes. <laughs> Adams Court, Germantown. Couldn't hear you. See, it's Saki. Yes, Adams Court, Germantown. Yes, that's me. Um, but judging by the age of the people in this attendance, um, I think you'll remember some of the things that transpired through history. Uh, back in the 60s, the Watergate, Richard Bar Cox, uh, and the Saturday Night Massacre, the Ken Starr investigation of the Clintons, and now we're dealing with Barbara Mueller investigating um, the Trump administration and how I'm going there. My deep concern comes from the attack on our judicial system, our attack on our federal uh, law enforcement agencies, attack on our news media. And I would like, to, and I know there are some proposals out there by various representatives in the Senate and the Congress to try to protect Robert Mueller from any actions taken on by the administration. And I would love to hear your voice, not just written word, your voice committed to the fact that you will support the, the final conclusion and make sure it takes place of Robert Mueller's investigation. And one other thing, I'd just like to hear your comments um, from Senator Johnson's words this last week in regard to the secret society. Yeah. First of all, let me say I have 100% confidence in Robert Mueller, period. You know, when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the last decade, he was the FBI director. I had, you know, a continuous professional relationship with him that worked out very well. And a lot of it had to do with FBI procurement of, uh, you know, uh, tracking, you know, uh, cases so that they could be able to put the various field agents reports to, uh, together. And I think he did a marvelous job after 9-11, which happened six days after he was sworn in as the FBI director. You know, so talk about you know, a baptism of, of real fire. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, I would point out that, uh, you know, when Mr. Mueller found out that Peter Strzok uh, had uh, the background that he did, he fired him immediately, as he should have. Uh, I think there's some problems at the top of the FBI that need to be addressed because I don't think the FBI should ever become a political police force. Uh, you know, they should be strictly apolitical. You know, they should invest potential criminal and terrorist activity uh, and, you know, uh, go to grand juries and get indictments where the evidence leads them to do that. So, uh, you know, it's basically up to Mr. Mueller when his uh, uh, investigation is concluded. I am not going to prejudge what reports he makes, but he has my 100% confidence and I've worked with the man, we're on a first name basis, you know, and there's nothing that leads me to believe uh, that uh, he is going to do anything but the job that he was paid to <coughs> by the Deputy Attorney General. Well, will you verbally say that when it comes to a point in time where there's pressure being put on the investigation? Will you verbally stand, stand tall and tell the people? Well, you know, the, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, the, this is an executive uh, branch prerogative because the Constitution gives the appointment power exclusively to the president uh, on that. You know, if you ask me whether Mueller should be fired or dismissed or leave his job involuntarily, you know, I answer that question, no. Uh, he should not, and I have 100% confidence in him being able to call him as he sees him. Uh, you know, and I think the fact that he fired Mr. Strzok uh, who is devoted, you know, indicates that if he sees a rotten apple in his barrel, he's prepared to get rid of him. Can you then comment on Senator Johnson's uh, well, I, I have, you know, I have no knowledge, you know, of that, you know, uh, all of us on the Judiciary Committee that has oversight over the FBI, you know, end up getting a lot of gossip from, uh, have got a lot of gossip from the FBI agents. I would never repeat any of that. I understand, I understand, but the, the, the way he he framed his thoughts on the secret society concerned me. Well, and again, you know, he'll have to answer that for himself. You know, I I don't answer for anybody else. You know, I'm responsible for what I say, but I don't think I should be responsible for what anybody else says. Carol and Jean Mary of Sunburst Trail in Germantown. Here, sir, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuno, for all for your service to the state of Wisconsin. You speak up a bit, please. Thank you very much for your service to the state for this part of the for this part of the state. Uh, question regarding the, the Nunes report or the I believe it's the FISA memo. Uh, your thoughts on that as to uh, have you seen it and do you feel that the American public should or that should be shared well, with the public? When it comes out well, absolutely, the American public should see the FISA memo. And it's my understanding that uh, the <coughs> Intelligence Committee is going to vote to declassify it and uh, release it to the public uh, this week or maybe first part of next week. Uh, the President has five days to say no, and the President has already announced that uh, uh, he will not say no to releasing it to the public. Now, have I seen it? No. And the reason for that is that if I saw it, I couldn't talk about it. And when it's released, I want to be able to talk about it. And uh, the intelligence community has been playing games with members of Congress for years and years, uh, uh, having classified briefings and things that have appeared in the news media, basically to make sure that members of Congress can't talk about it because they would be releasing classified information. Now, I'll give you the most egregious example that occurred about 20 years ago. Uh, they passed out copies of Time Magazine, and on uh, top of one of the articles in Time Magazine, they put a post-it that said, Top Secret. Now, this is Time Magazine, where millions of copies have been distributed around the world. And to his credit, the chairman of the committee at the time uh, directed the members of the committee not to look at it and directed the intelligence community to pick up all of the copies and not show them to any of the members of the committee. That's how far they go in trying to treat members of Congress that are supposed to do oversight as suckers. So I made it a point 
that are only to see classified information that I absolutely have to see. Not any of these run-of-the-mill things that any member of Congress, you know, can go in and see, you know, for the very reason uh, that it, whatever is in there is published in the news media, I can comment on what the news media has revealed. And DC is leaky as a sieve, and that includes classified information. So when it's released, I'll be happy to comment on it. But I haven't seen it, that's why. Uh, Jean Mary. Liz Zabel, Borough Road, Germantown. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a concern when they're talking about uh, getting... Um, Can you speak up? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I have a cold like you, but I'll be a little louder. I have a concern over the immigration that they're about calling on possibly proving. I'm not against people who come into this country legally following the process. I have a problem, though, with people who come across the border, stay for a while, and disappear instead of going to the court cases. Are we, because they set up cases for each one of these in the past few years, but they don't show up for their court cases. Are those people going to be allowed in? That's one group. Now the thing that you need to be aware of, and maybe you are, is there are a lot of college students who come here and don't, once a visa's done, they're not going home. And that is not all of them. There's some of them who follow the law, but many do not. I know that because I've had multiple kids College, and they they have a, they know exactly what the supposed method is to be done. That is a problem because if you want to let people come to this country legally, there is a system. They need to follow that system, and it has to be everyone. That's a lawlessness. I don't care what country they come from. If they meet all the criteria and they come in, that is not an issue. But it's getting way out of hand, and I think the worst part for me, I ran into right before Christmas. Um, grandmother in this community whose husband was a um, Korean War veteran. She has two grandchildren that are in the service and she has one of her grandchildren that a few years back was hurt in a car accident on 4145 and permanently disabled. Where is the concern for that, to avoid that? He didn't have a license, didn't really have a lot of drive. Those are an issue. Now that's an example, that's not everybody who comes into this country by any means. But those are things that need to be dealt with. And the other thing that's very dangerous is these M13s who have come across, I believe they're in the southern, some of the southern, uh, it's not Mexico, I believe it's Honduras and some of those areas there. This is a very dangerous group of people. If anybody's been watching the, the uh, news, you would find out that far too many of them are coming into this country and they're a gang who are killing a lot of people. And these are within the schools. Now, some of these parents out east in particular are very devastated. This is not a good thing. How are you going to, or are they going to be looking at a way of being able to verify everyone who's come into this country? They well, might get citizenship. Uh, you, know, you know, immigration is a mess. And what the president has proposed and what the response from Democrats has been only deals with the tip of the iceberg. But I guess you never walk a mile without taking the first step. You know, first of all, you know, let me say that I think that the Dreamers ought to be allowed to stay here uh, if they do not have any type of a criminal record and they have been, you know, uh, <coughs> good members and have added to American society. Uh, under what terms and conditions, you know, that's going to be what the principal, you know, debate is going to be. But, uh, 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 you know, what I do think, you know, is, is that if the Dreamers are allowed to stay here, we have to end chain migration. Because once you become a U.S. citizen, then you can sponsor a whole lot of other people, and then the in-laws can sponsor the in-laws, can sponsor the in-laws, can sponsor the in-laws. And there is no, you know, there's no real check. Uh, you know, on these people who get sponsored as a result of the chain migration. So, uh, you know, that is going to be an issue, and I think those two things are going to have to be tied together if we're to reach some kind of an agreement on what will happen to the dreamers. Now, secondly, the president has been quite plain, you know, in saying that there has to be border <coughs> security uh, as a part of the deal. Uh, this does not exclusively mean the wall. You know, it means other kinds of border security, 
um, such as levees along the river, high-tech stuff like drones <coughs> and infrared sensors. It means more border patrol agents. It means more ICE agents to do the internal uh, enforcement. And in my opinion, it means that we need to have some kind of an e-verify program so that the people that Americans are hiring uh, are legally uh, supposed to be able to work here uh, because the cheap jobs of the uh, employers that want to break the law are one of the magnets that bring people illegally across the board. We're going to have a lot of debate on this, but this is more complicated than dreamers yes or no or wall yes or no. You know, it, it, we, it, this debate is going to go much further into the weeds but there's going to have to be some kind of a package and a compromise that is put together uh, because if there is no compromise, there will be no law and the dreamers' uh, uh, hopes will end up expiring on March 4th. Now, to talk about your other things that uh, you talked about, um, you know, first of all, about half the illegal immigrants in this country are visa overstates and about the other half are people who illegally entered in the country in the first place. We need an entry exit system. We're about the only industrialized country that does not have an entry exit system. You, know, you leave the country, there's going to be no U.S. government agent that ends up checking your passport and running it through so it goes into a database. You come back from Europe, you're going to have that kind of a check happen in practically every place in the world. The second thing, uh, you know, we need to have, you know, is a better identification of where people are. Now, one of the things that I did when I was chairman of the committee is we ramped up uh, the student visa program. So now there is a tracking system that when a foreigner is admitted to a U.S. college or university, they get an I-20 form. They take the I-20 form to a U.S. consulate or embassy overseas they get their visa. If that visa is then entered into the system, when they enter the country, it is entered into the system. When they enroll in school, it is entered into the system. When they leave school, it is entered or supposed to be entered into the system. And when they leave the country, it is supposed to be entered into the system. Now, where the hole in this goes is that there are a lot of institutions of higher education or even secondary school do not enter a student into the system when they enroll, and they don't enter the student into the system when they leave. Uh, but the machinery is there and the law is there. It requires a little bit more cooperation. Now, finally, with respect to MS-13, which is the most vicious of the gangs, but uh, there are other gangs that are just slightly uh, less vicious. Uh, the Justice Department at the President's order has gone on a specific targeted role to find MS-13 members and to deport them and to make sure they don't come back. Uh, and that's the top priority. In terms of any of these groups of people, whether they're dreamers or others, uh, that potentially will be allowed to stay during the compromises and negotiations that would be going on in the next five weeks or so, uh, anybody with a criminal record uh, a record of any type of a violence, violent crime, they will not be eligible for any benefit that the Congress may choose to create and the President may choose to sign. So, you know, if, you know, if it ends up that there's some kind of amnesty uh, for dreamers, if you're MS-13 and you're convicted, you don't get it, and out you go. And there will be increased uh, 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 surveillance on the border make sure that you don't come back. Thank you. Uh, Neil Ristler, Harrison uh, Circle. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you and your colleagues for passing the tax reform bill. I think it uh, was a necessary piece of legislation and it will have dramatic impact in the future years. I too want to talk a little bit about immigration. Uh, basically, I echo what the last speaker had said. However, I just want to make sure that if there is an agreement that funds are made for securing the border, et cetera, that that gets put in place before 
there is any kind of action to allow citizenship for the people who are well, legally. To answer your question specifically, under the plan that the president announced a couple of days ago, uh, the legalization of the Dreamers will take 10 to 12 years. And they will be allowed to stay, they will have uh, a working work permit uh, on that. And what the president wants to do is to put the full $25 billion for border security into a trust fund, you know, which means he doesn't have to go plead and holler, you know, every year when Congress passes appropriation bills, you know, that this will be a commitment that the Congress will make, you know, in conjunction with the president, and, you know, we don't have threats of government shutdowns over this issue or anything like that, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of the details are going to be up to negotiation, uh, but the Dreamers aren't going to be legalized under the best set of circumstances before the 10 to 12 years. And uh, the trust fund, you know, will be created so the president or any of his successors don't have to uh, come to Congress on their knees every year and say, pretty please, will you give us some more money uh, so that we can do a little bit more on border security. Lynn Carey, Windsor, Windsong Court, Germantown. I, I am uh, here because I spent a couple hours today going through your voting record and the legislation that's gone forward. And at the end of my time, I was really thinking about one question. And preface to that question, I'd like to say that many of the articles that I've read from mainstream media, not Fox News, not MSNBC, really talked about the damage that has been done under Trump to not only domestic, and I will talk about specifics, but also international or global issues. For example, um, the national debt has really increased. The trade deficit is much worse. There has been a lot of difficulties in terms of the division within our country. Race issues have increased. Um, we had, what, someone held me, um, 11 high school shootings so far in the month of January, and not any attention paid to that. And Jeff Bush, interestingly enough, is one of the columns, one of his um, talks that I read, and he talked about how our country is really suffering under the rhetoric and character of Donald Trump. Everything from white supremacy to racist comments to his comments about women, and I'm not going to even get into the Fuel and Fury, Fury book or Stormy Daniels or any of that. We get a poll, and 70% close to 70% of the American people said they would not hold Donald Trump as a role model to their children. And yet he is the president of these United States. So my question to you, and then I do have a question for uh, Mr. Canova, is what will it take? What will it take for Republicans to stand up and say enough? What will it take for whom I thought in the past were patriotic people to see what's happening, what's happening global, globally. The, the back and forth around whose nuclear button is larger. Um, calling countries, I won't even say the word that is used. You know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And, and really talking about people that whether they're immigrants, whether they're here legally or illegally, but in good faith, not trying to help people, but really dismissing and disparaging and dehumanizing people. As someone, whether my politics align with yours or Mr. Trump's, they don't, but at the end of the day, I do look for character and the rhetoric that represents this great country. So as I said, my question to you is, when will this stop? And that question came out of a whole list of other questions around DACA, the Dreamers, the investigation, the Nunes letter, which was written by the Republican who chaired the 
uh, secure the Judicial Committee, all sorts of inherent problems there. But I want to know what will it take? When I woke up one morning and I saw a couple of senators, including Jeff Flake, talk about the challenge to our country, I said to myself, now there's a patriot. I don't believe in his policies, but there, sir, is a patriot. So my question is, where do you see yourself? Are you a moderate? Are you a Tea Party person? Are you a Trump supporter? Well, to answer your question, uh, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. I understand. Uh, he will be president of the United States and Lord voting until January 20th, 2021. Uh, and uh, as far as I, you know, the American people wanted something different, and they got something different. They didn't want business as usual. And, uh, Trump certainly uh, represented no business as usual. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I will support Trump, but I believe he needs to be supported for the good of the people of this district and the good of the country. And I will oppose him when I think his policies are not good. And a couple weeks ago, when the FISA reauthorization bill came up, I was one of those that unsuccessfully led the opposition to something that the administration was very strongly in favor of. So, no, I'm not a rubber stamp. I'm independently elected. You know, I think that uh, the FISA abuses uh, both potential and what has what has happened, uh, you know, has got to be curtailed. And uh, you know, I strongly feel, you know, that you know, Amer if Americans' phone records and electronic communications, you know, are to be <coughs> stupid uh, by the NSA. You know, they ought to get a warrant first, you know, just like in a criminal investigation. Fourth Amendment requires there to be a warrant based on probable cause. And I understand that, but I'm asking you, <coughs> do you support his rhetoric and his behavior? I, you know, I said to answer the earlier question, the only, you know, words that I am responsible for is the words that come out of my mouth. You know, the people who, other people who say that, they are responsible for words that come out of their mouths. But I'm not going to make a value judgment, and I didn't <coughs> President Obama or President Clinton uh, or, uh, you, know, you know, any other Democrat office holders. You know, they're responsible for what they say as Republicans are. And I'm responsible only for what I say. I, uh, Congressman, I understand that, but I am asking you as a constituent, as a constituent, what is your, where do you see yourself in terms of, would you support his comments regarding North Korea? Well, he's got the attention. Things seems to be uh, a lot better there. You know, I remember that uh, Jimmy Carter went over there in 1994, you know, and got an agreement that they wouldn't do any of their nuclear stuff. And we sent him about $2 billion worth of aid and they kept on doing it, you know. I, you know, every and George W. Bush sent somebody over there, and they broke their promises. So, you know, as far as trusting anything that the Kim family does in North Korea, I think we would be very naive to do so. And it, it's just as much as Neville Chamberlain trusted that Hitler. I don't think I'm going to get an answer. So I just want you to know that many of us are very concerned. You got. You didn't get the answer so you yes wanted, Ms. Carey. I gave you me. how I feel, and I've been very consistent in saying every time somebody else makes a comment, I'm not going to shoot my mouth off on that. So you will not stand up to Trump no matter what he says? I stand up so to Trump on issues. I stood, up, I stood up to Trump so you know, on Pfizer still. And I criticized the administration's policy. But not his record. Well, okay. I criticized the policy and I voted against it. I'm John. All right. Okay. And then. Well, that wasn't enough. Okay. Maybe I should have voted for it. It wouldn't be any more, more or less critical if I voted for the fight. No, I'm just looking for the Republicans to either voice concern or to talk to their constituents about their concern regarding the behavior of the president. I didn't do the same concerning. thing about President Obama, Ms. Kerry. I Every time he said something I didn't like or disagreed with, I wasn't there shooting my mouth off, and I'm not going to do that 
for any of the other presidents. They're, they're big boys and girls and they got to stand up, you know, and back up their own rhetoric just like I will back up my own rhetoric. Um, Mr. Minotto, a couple of things. One is, I would really like to voice my concern and I'm so sorry for what you're going through in terms of health care insurance. As a retired nurse, it's, it's a tough, tough thing and I'm sorry for that. And the governor in his recent State of the State address talked about Badger Care and there is a proposal which would allow all of us who could buy into Badger Care to do that. He wants to run it through and give the money to the insurance company, something like $200 million. There's also legislation, as I just said, that people would be able to buy into Badger Care, which would be about 25% less expensive for families. It would provide to a large range of people the opportunity to buy insurance. And yet, this, this kind of it doesn't make much sense proposals coming out in terms of the insurance companies. Will there be any question, or would you support Badger Care for all for the people of the 24th district and the state of Wisconsin, first question. And second of all, um, I don't know, I just read today a really scathing, scathing article about um, what's happened in our state, Wisconsin is highlighted, on uh, voting and gerrymandering. And that's with the Supreme Court now. But will the Republicans still um, look, as you took it to the Supreme Court, to do something about gerrymandering? Uh, well, on, on Badger Care, when uh, when I came in uh, to office, which is nine years ago now, there was a waiting list of people to, uh, looking to obtain coverage, uh -huh. and uh, that was one of the first things that was addressed through the Walker administration and, and ourselves in the legislature. There's no waiting list anymore. Everybody has, has coverage. Well, who got who? who uh, well, could you please let him answer? Everybody has coverage. Coverage is available. As far as the premiums go, we uh, have, a, the governor just announced, a, a plan, a proposal that's out there now, to assist in premium supports. So that uh, we're, we still have the Obamacare plans that people are suffering under as far as premiums go. Um, we can give you examples. And uh, we put the, forward a proposal that would help in that situation. So would you Again, support Badger Care for All? Would you please let him answer this? I don't. Badger Care for All is not necessary. So what, the vast majority of our uh, the people of the state of Wisconsin are covered through employer-sponsored plans. And that's working out very well. So the vast majority have employer-sponsored plans. Badger Care is going to then take care of others. And then finally, we have already in the state assembly uh, passed legislation to support the pre-existing concerns that we heard earlier. So we have voted, showing our support that uh, we feel strongly that those with pre-existing pre conditions will have coverage and those will not be held against them. So we, we, we put that out there. Oh, redistricting. Uh, redistricting, I took an oath that uh, redistricting is a legislative function. Redistricting was done legislatively. It has gone through the courts. Now it's the Supreme Court. I can't answer to what the ruling will be. I respect we'll know shortly. Uh, but until that comes forward, uh, it's, it's business as usual. It hasn't been for, for years and years that uh, redistricting is a legislative process through our Constitution. Please read the article, sir. Uh, Philip, is it Philip Ogden of Lyle, Maine, in Germantown? Right. right, thank you. Um, over the years, uh, the abortion issue has been a, at least one cup. Uh, oh, the abortion issue has been an important issue for Republicans, with uh, a Republican president, Republican Congress, and a conservative court. I'm surprised I haven't heard anything about the abortion issue in the in the last year. Are you aware of any action in Congress to address that issue? What, you know, the fact that the Republicans were elected to run everything? Uh, no, I'm just asking if there's any plans to address the abortion issue. 
Well, uh, as far as the abortion issue is concerned, uh, in the first week last year, we passed a we passed legislation to make the Hyde Amendment permanent rather than uh, something that had to be renewed every year. Uh, week before last, uh, we passed a paid capable abortion ban, uh, and basically it would ban abortions after 20 weeks. Both of those bills are pending in the Senate, so the House has passed uh, both of these bills. The Senate. Uh, uh, it will be up to the Senate on whether to take it up or debate it, and hopefully, in my opinion, pass it. <clears throat> Keith Hetzel, St. Thomas Drive in the Falls. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank you for all the help that you've been giving us for the committee to save pensions, and hope that hopefully this will get, what is it, the Butch, the Butch Lewis bill? Will be will be attached somehow and passed. Uh, could you speak up? I didn't get. That. Oh, it's got to do with the committee to save pensions, the Butch oh. Lewis bill. I'd just like to thank you for all the help you've been giving us. Uh, you know what I can say is I think the next move is as I'm uh, told by Bob in the back of the room that the GEO report will come out either next month or in March. And I think that Congress is going to wait until that comes out to figure out what to do. Uh, what I can say is, you know, whatever fix is passed has got to be done in a way so this issue never comes up again. You know, that this is a permanent fix. And when we see, you know, uh, all the employer pension funds like central states, you know, end up, uh, uh, you know, getting into trouble, uh, a caution light is turned on you know, at an early time so that it doesn't go spirally into the fact that it might be bankrupt in a few years. So we got to make sure that once it's fixed, this is going to be a permanent fix, and we're not just setting ourselves up to having to face the same issue 15 or 25 years down the road. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Peggy Reeder, Final Act Avenue, Germantown. I was going to ask about the first one, that what exactly uh, you know, what is your fix about the Bush Lewis Act? Pardon? Same question. I just want, I didn't understand what your fix, what you're promoting as your fix to fix the pension plan. Well, there, there is a bill that has been introduced uh, that is currently in committee. That's the Bush Lewis Act? Uh, uh, I'm going to wait until the GAO report comes out to decide what to do about that bill, and I'm going to wait until the committee action. Uh, takes place because bills can be turned around in committee uh, quite a bit. So I'm not going to make a commitment to vote either for or against it until I see precisely what I'm being asked to vote on. Archie Reader, same address. Good evening. Thank you for uh, making your parents here. Um, Kimberly Clark recently uh, announced they're going to cut 5,000 jobs and close several shop factories around the world. Um, Recognize, and the reason that they gave for that is that the birth rate in the United States is down to the point where they don't need as many diapers. Now, Stephen Miller is coming to the president and saying, look, we got to stop, stop the immigration. Let's make it a merit-based system. Let's cut what we're letting in by half. If we're not in supporting the diversification and immigration by the rest, from the rest of the world, this has always been the beacon on the hill. If Stephen Miller is allowed to steer the president because he doesn't have any personal ideals, then we as a nation are going to continue to decline. Our population is going to shrink. We're getting older already. But we need immigration for the country to continue to grow. I agree we need immigration, but we need to fix a broken system. I agree. That's what it's talking about. Now, uh, I think what the president came out with uh, about a week ago is something that probably horrifies Stephen Miller from what he told our immigration task force that I uh, serve on. And what the president's offer to the dreamer is, are, or is, you know, is much more generous than anything Obama ever offered during his eight years as president. Uh, so, you know, let's, you know, stop taking a breath and take a look at that rather than just saying because it's Trump, it's bad. Uh, on that, you know, I I was amazed at how generous, you know, the Trump proposal was to the Dreamer. 
but at the same time, he has reiterated the fact uh, that you know border security has got to go along with this uh, with this issue, and uh, that uh, uh, we need to do something particularly about the visa lottery system. The generosity that he's offering, though, to give people a pathway to citizenship is offered with a requirement for a $25 billion bill, which was originally $18 billion, but now he wants $25 billion plus $5 billion more for border security beyond the wall. So that's not a gift that he's giving the dollars <coughs> advance. That's All that's I'm saying is no compromise, no deal. You know, you got to remember that any legislation that is passed by Congress addressing any part of this issue has got to be signed into law by the president. And the president has put down his marker. Now, people who do not who do not accept what his marker is are asking for a veto, nothing to happen, and the dreamers become deportable. But he put his marker down on Tuesday and said whatever the Senate brings to him, no, he's ready to sign. On Thursday, he changes his mind. He invites Lindsey Graham and Dick Durbin to come to the White House and make a deal, and Stephen Miller brought in the troops to, to prevent the president from taking action. Well, you know, all, all I can say is, is that, you know, he actually put something on paper, and I have it here, and that came out on Monday of last week. And is that the after, after, after product? Sir, may I answer, please? Sure. This was after the Lindsey Graham, Dick Durbin, Stephen Miller uh, meeting. Now, when Miller came before our immigration task force, he had 70 border security things that he was talking <coughs> about, you know, speaking for the White House. He was kind of left out of the place, you know, there. But, you know, uh, I would never have believed that if Miller had any kind of influence with the president, the president would have called for a pathway to citizenship. But Trump has been very plain, you know, in saying that that has to come along with border security. And you've got to either accept them both or reject them both. You can't pick one and reject the other. And, you know, there are a lot of people either on the far right or the far left that would love to pick one and reject the other. That means nothing's going to happen. You know, take my word for it. And the next problem will be getting the House to bring up the Senate bill. Well, yeah, well. you know, I'm not the president. I, you know, don't decide to sign your veto bills on uh, that, you know, I think you got to take Trump with his word on this and listen to President. <laughs> <laughs> well, even in 2013, when the Senate... Uh, sir, yes. he is the President. Under the Constitution, he does have the power to sign our veto bills. And I'm just saying, you know, and I'm out there listening to this stuff all the time, Is he serious <coughs> about this. Now, if you don't think he's serious about this, and this is funny, then there are going to be a lot of people called dreamers or DACA kids who are going to end up being deportable because people just laugh at what the president's parameters are. Think about it. But the House Martin Ketterer, uh, saw <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can remember a number of years ago when our famous John Kerry and President Obama signed this horrendous deal with Iran. And so now we have people on the verge of becoming nuclear nations. Once that happens, the other surrounding nations are going to want to be the same way. The other thing that happened is Obama commissioned the Bo Simpson Commission, a bipartisan commission, to look at taxes, the um, deficit, Social Security, which Social Security has been having problems for more than 30 years. They've been forecasting problems with Social Security and the funding. Same way with Medicare. Nothing was ever done. They had control of the presidency, the Congress, and the Senate, and they just let it go. So the other thing that's happening is that I see a resurgence in America positivity. This America first. As a veteran, I look around and I see my friends and my neighbors and my children and grandchildren. They're becoming more engaged. This tax law probably should, I hope, help us with the deficit payments to other countries. Our businesses should be more competitive on an international basis. And I just love that. 
So I like the way our country is going. There's, there's a great new movement in our country that's happened in the last few years. And to me, it's fantastic. One thing I'd like to ask you, Mr. Canovo, is um, I would support some kind of drug testing for people on aid. If I want a drug habit, I'm going to pay for it myself, but I don't want to pay for other people's. And that has been our, our position at the welfare reform that's being, being laid out. We'll, we'll have those requirements. Uh, you will have, if they're going to be work ready, they're going to have to be drug free. And so that's a requirement of many employers. And, uh, but further, we go a step further. If we identify somebody who has a, a drug addiction, or whatever it might be, we will first offer services to get them over that addiction, and then even uh, workforce training to get them prepared to enter the workforce. A follow-up question? So just recently, West Rock on River Lane put huge placards out front advertising for Help Wanted. JW Speaker has, has had Help Wanted signs out there for I don't know how long. I look in the papers, I look around, there's all kinds of jobs available. Somehow, we have to develop a way to get these people that are on aid, that are living off of these, what, entitlements? I don't think that's what we should call them. But they're living off of aid. We need to somehow get them trained and into the workforce. There's a lot of companies that need employees right now. And, and that's what exactly what these proposals will do. They'll have work requirements built into that. Thank you. Okay, Brian Snyder of Menominee Falls. Thanks, Jim. Um, I've uh, recently been struggling too with my health insurance at work because it's gone up so much. I've had five back surgeries and one open heart surgery and probably not done yet. So it's a scary thing because, you know, now I hear this thing happening where they're struggling with pre-existing conditions. I will take any solution from the private sector over a single payer system, which scares the heck out of me because, frankly, when it comes to health care, I want the best you can get. And I simply don't think you can have it both. If the government takes this over, if it ever gets to that point, that, that's what Obamacare was all about. It was about getting the government to take over the whole thing. I think the quality of care would have just diminished. And when I needed an old, when I needed the best surgeon that money could buy at St. Luke's, I probably wouldn't have been able to get it because we've seen this experiment in other countries and frankly, <coughs> Second question, comment. Um, I talk to a lot of people. I'm a salesperson. I talk to a lot of people at work. I have very liberal friends. I have conservative friends. They're all on board with this concept of term limits for politicians senators and congressmen. I think that I could run on that issue alone to get elected because there's so much support for it. Everybody supports it that I know. I don't understand why we can't get that movement going in our country. I, the other question I have is, what would it take legislative, legislatively, hypothetically, if somebody actually wanted this to happen? How would that go about? It would require a constitutional amendment. And what does that mean? That uh, means two thirds of the House, the Senate, and 34 states. Who would have to start that? How would that get started? Well, there, there are two ways to start it. One is Congress starting it, and the other is a convention of states that are called by state legislators. Which sounds almost impossible. But I guess, in, in my mind, the concept of people coming from the private sector going to serve our government and going back in the private sector and having lived to live underneath those laws that you guys passed is a great concept because I think it could reform the law. Well, you know, I term limits, in my opinion, are a bad idea. And I know that because I've been, I've been in for a while, you probably would say I'm self-serving on um, this. But hear me out on this. You know, first of all, of the three branches of government, the only one that's completely elected is the Congress. That's the only one that's responsible directly to the people. You know, we have a president, the vice president, nobody else, the executive branch is elected, and the full federal judiciary is appointed for life. Now, if you have people go in and out of Congress, 
you lose the institutional memory that Congress has, and you turn it over to lobbyists, and you turn it over to the congressional staff. Uh, many lobbyists are ex-congressmen. You know, they'll, they make a lot more money being lobbyists than being congressmen, and they go peddle you know, their wares. You have no control over either the congressional staff or uh, people who are hired to you know, call as lobbyists. Now, the second thing uh, is, is that in states that have had term limits, and California is the one that is the most prominent uh, on that, as soon as somebody is elected, they start showing for the next job, you know, which means that they become real cozy with special interest groups uh, and, stuff like, and stuff like that, rather than be independent. And, you know, I'm one that believes that the reward for keeping in touch and doing a good job is re-election. And for doing a bad job, the voters ought to take it upon themselves and elect somebody else. Uh, but when you start shilling for the next job, you end up destroying the independence of the legislative body that is the only body at the federal level that's elected by the people. Now, the final point, I'm going to make two more brief points. Uh, Mexico has a one-term limit for everybody from president of the republic down to dog catcher. And Mexico has one of the most historically corrupt governments in the Western Hemisphere. And that's because people know they don't have to put their record uh, before the people uh, on that. So they can you know, go and do what they want to. You know, there's all kinds of corruption down there. The corruption has shown uh, itself as a breakdown of law and order and the rule of law. The other thing is, is that you will never get anybody from Wisconsin in any <coughs> leadership position with a term limit uh, on that. We have eight votes out of 435. California has 53, Texas has 35, Florida has 29, and New York's got 21 or so. They will divide up the good positions there amongst themselves. And those who come from middle-sized states like ours or small states uh, uh, like Delaware will never be able to get an influential position whatsoever. Now, if you look at, you know, you look back the last 30 years, we currently have got the Speaker of the House from Wisconsin. He got that not because we block voted for him, he got that because of respect amongst his Republican colleagues. We had David Obey, who was a very good legislator, Democrat, longtime chair of the Appropriations Committee. We had Senator Proxmire, an immensely popular and independent person, you know, who exposed an awful lot of, of federal waste and, you know, was able to get the cloud to be able to make some of that stick because, you know, he was around a long time. And we had Les Aspen, also a Democrat, who became such an expert on defense policy and chairman of the committee, the President Clinton named him Secretary of Defense. Now, none of that would have happened, you know, with Wisconsin common sense if we had term limits, uh, because we wouldn't be able to establish a track record and get the respect to be able to get them into positions like this. So, you know, the thing is, is that I don't think the Constitution should tell you who you can't vote for any more than the Constitution should tell you who you have to vote for. So those are communist constitutions, because that's the kind of elections they held in communist countries. You know, it should be up to each individual voter when they go to the polls and make a decision for themselves whether somebody who should merit re-election, regardless of whether they've been in a short time or a long time, or somebody should not merit election whether they've been in a short time or a long time. And, you know, there are a lot of people, you know, who have gotten elected and have completely screwed up in their first term. You read, read about them in the paper, and, you know, should they you know, stick around for six years or 12 years or, or whatever, you know, the answer is no. The first election may come up, uh, somebody else should run against them, point out, you know, how they would do a better job and, you know, let the voters decide. Thanks. Uh, Charles Brown, Park Avenue in Germantown. My questions have been addressed. Thank you. Next up is Monica Fedel. Uh, Chippewa, Germantown. I'll talk loud. I'm the mother of boys and grand boys. <laughs> so, um, 
I was going to just talk about the wall. My reason for coming here was that, but now I'm listening. I just have to comment. My grandparents were immigrants to this country from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They spoke German when they came here. Eventually, learned English. Hardworking people. My dad was a hardworking man. He was in the Navy from 39 to 45. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He worked at PAPS for 35 years. It's wrong. Our health care needs to get fixed. He died in a nursing home on a Title 19. All of the money he frugally saved all of their lives. And believe me, when, when I wanted a Barbie doll, I got a Tammy because it was cheaper. <laughs> they were frugal people. They saved and they lost everything to health care. To the nursing home, yes, severe Parkinson's um, disease. And so our health care system does not work. This young man here with cancer, I too am a cancer survivor. Mine will come back because that's the kind I have. My oncologist is an immigrant. His Dr. Abdel Al Quasmi, Community Memorial Freighter. Um, I would love to retire. I'm 60. I've worked since I was 16, except for a couple months having my boys. I've worked since I was 16. I'm 60 years old now. I would love to retire and spend the last several years babysitting grandchildren. But I can't because that, that 60 to 65 year old gap, um, they might not give me insurance because of my pre existing condition, or they might make it so unaffordable that it would be impossible. So I am working. I'm working at a job that has health care. I'm extremely hardworking. As I said, my husband's extremely hardworking. I raised kids that are college graduates. And, and did are very well. They're homeowners. One bought a house in Germantown a few years ago. So I have one grandchild three minutes from my house. So I'm very happy. But health care is a big concern. And my own parents, my parents who saved hundreds of thousands of dollars, lost it all to their nursing home. And my dad died on Title 19. And he would have been sick knowing that because he was very proud and a very hardworking man. But with Parkinson's, you don't have all your capabilities anymore when you are dying of that. <clears throat> Anyways, the reason I am here is about the wall. We are hardworking. I'm frugal. I would for parents, I'm frugal. It bothers me to no end that our government wants to spend $35 billion on the blank and wall. I, I, it's a wall. It's not going to stop anything. People are here, like you said, on visas. I have to commend you that you really know what you're talking about. I, this is my first town hall I've ever been to. I'm very, very impressed, and I thank you for having this. But I have to tell you, the wall's not going to do any good. They make tunnels. There's ultralights that can go over. The drugs get dropped on the side of the wall. It's billions of dollars of my tax dollars that he wants to spend on this stupid wall. I've been a travel agent for 39 years. I know people from other countries come here um, on student visas, on tourist visas, and then blend into society and you never hear what happens to them. You know, that wall isn't going to do nothing. It's just his matter of pride that, he, that this is some kind of a symbol. I'm not giving him $35 billion of my tax money because of his pride is going to get hurt if he doesn't build this wall. I, I, but I also, I, I, I am not totally Democratic, I'm not totally Republican, I am me. And I think a lot of voters are, are themselves. So yes, I think you should work to get aid. I agree with that, I think that's wonderful. You know, if you're able-bodied, I think you should work. Even though I had a, a adopted brother that was autistic who couldn't work. There are some people that can't, but if you can't, I, I agree with that. But please, please do what you can not to waste our money on stupid, stupid things. I have traveled out of this country three times in the last year because that's what I do for a living. And I have to tell you, our reputation has been ground into the dirt internationally. I've been to Scotland. I've been to Ireland. I've been to um, Czechoslovakia. I've been to Hungary and Germany, all within the last year because uh, it's what I do. But it is, um, there wasn't one soul that didn't say, what the heck is going on in your country? You know, that they, they, they were appalled by what's going on here. And I know there are good Republicans as well as good Democrats. 
and it, it affirms me that this man is is dragging us into the mud. And I need we need the good Republicans to stand up and say, you know, we've got
A couple of really big things happen. Uh, the Marshall Plan and rural electrification. Um, you know, Europe was destroyed. We helped rebuild it. Rural electrification. Uh, awful lot of farms didn't have power. Uh, farms work better with electricity. Who would have thunk? Um, we seem to have forgotten that with Puerto Rico. Half the, and these are citizens. These are citizens. Um, about half the island still doesn't have power. I sell internet for a, for a living, okay? A business just comes to a screaming hop, uh, halt if their corex goes down. Can you imagine trying to run a business if the light switch doesn't work? What the heck are you gonna do? How do you generate income if you don't have electricity? Now, you would think that we'd be able to do something about that. In the past century, we did the Marshall Plan, we did brush, you know, rural electrification. Puerto Rico's just an island. You would have thought that we would have been able to do that. Apparently, we can't anymore. Make America great again? We can't even fix Puerto Rico! <laughs> So, you know, working on, yeah, not so much. I was at a different town hall, not yours. The congressman said, oh, we spent enough money down there. These are citizens. We ex should, shouldn't more be expected of this nation? If we're going to be great, wouldn't it be great if we were great? And so, you know, it, it's just, I just reminded of George Bush II saying, good work, Brownie. Can I ask now? In the last Congress, uh, I worked with Congressman Bishop of Utah, Congressman Duffy of Northern Wisconsin, uh, to put together a Puerto Rico restructuring bill. They were $72 billion in debt, and for over 12 years, what they had done is they borrowed money on Wall Street, uh, basically to pay their current expenses. Most state constitutions do not allow state governments to do that, and we don't allow municipal governments in this state to do that, you know, as well. But they have done that, you know, they basically had internal self-government. Uh, the federal income taxes that they pay do not go to the U.S. Treasury, but they go to the Puerto Rican uh, Treasury and successive governors down there and legislature, you know, just basically decided to put everything on the cup and sooner or later stuff ran out. And I worked closely with both President Obama and Treasury, Treasury Secretary Jack Lou to get that done. Now the power company down there was run by the Commonwealth government uh, on that. It was a public power system uh, and Rather than spending money on upgrading the grid down there, uh, they spent money on other stuff. And that was something that the Commonwealth government decided to do. Uh, half the island went without power when there was a grid failure before the hurricane came. And it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago where they decided to privatize the power system uh, you know, down there so that they would have people who have run you know, electric utility companies in the private sector and who know what they're doing, you know, end up providing power to the people of Puerto Rico and having a modern system that doesn't collapse all at once, you know, and stay collapsed. But, you know, this was a case of the Puerto Rican government, you know, ending up not only completely goofing up their finances, but goofing up a lot of the municipal services, you know, including uh, the, the power services. Now, you know, it's going to take a long time for Puerto Rico, you know, to get out of the hole. You know, half the island was without power, and the Puerto Rican government was giving the usual Christmas bonuses to all their employees down there, and they're broke. You know, if you're broke, you don't give, you know, bonuses. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, something where there is now a federal oversight board as a result of the bill that I described the 
you know, earlier on that uh, you know, at least it's going to be able to throw the red flag when they're both doing something goofy down there. You know, they hired somebody as a consultant, uh, you know, for the power system down there that had two employees. Well, I don't care how talented the two people are by themselves, no matter if they're really talented, aren't going to be able to fix up the mess that has been decades growing. Uh, so, you know, there's got to be some tough love in Puerto Rico, and merely sending them more money is not going to solve the problem, because that is what has been done in the past, and that is what has caused the problem. You know, they've got to start running their government in a fiscally responsible manner. And we know that it's going to take some time to do this, and this oversight board, you know, which was created by this law, a bipartisan law, you know, I might uh, I add, you know, is going to give them the time to make the transition. But, you know, the, the governor and the Puerto Rican legislature, you know, they've got to be on board to want this done. And there isn't a heck of a lot of evidence so far that uh, the governor and the Puerto Rican legislature want to have it done. If, if you look at the history of Puerto Rico, there's sufficient blame to go all the way around. Well, there, yeah, there's, Wall there, Street there's, there's, a, a, real there's a lot. Down there's down. a lot of blame, but you know, talk on it. You know, uh, I was one of those that you know stood up and came up with a way to fix it, and I did it in a bipartisan manner. And the law was passed in a bipartisan manner in both houses and signed by President Obama. And I had a couple of private conversations with him on how I saw it, and he accepted some of my ideas and didn't accept some of my ideas. But, uh, uh, you, know, you know, just to go ahead and to say to do business as usual and throw money down there is going to mean that they're going to spend the money as usual. And that was what got them $72 billion in the hole, uh, you know, which is worse on a per capita basis than Greece is. You know, they're the deadbeat of Europe. And if they want to borrow any money in the you know, the municipal bonding market, they're going to have to clean up their act because if they don't, don't do that, nobody's going to lend them a dime anymore. Pat Murphy, um, <coughs> to Roseway Avenue in the fall. In the fall. Thank you very much, Congressman, for passing the tax reform bill. I think that's going to help us a lot. And to your credit and President Trump's credit, I, our corporations now are going to be more competitive in the world, raising the rates from 35 to 21 percent, just a shade under the uh, global rate, and I think that's long overdue. Uh, the comment, uh, questions that I had have already been asked, but I did want to ask if you could elaborate on the Uranium One scandal <laughs> deal. How can we let that happen, that Uranium can fall into the hands of potential enemies, even leave a country to begin with? Uh, the Justice Department is investigating that now. Thanks. Okay. You know, uh, that, you know, the, you know, the thing is, is that there is this many cabinet secretaries that are supposed to approve these deals, uh, and, and, you know, of which the Secretary of State is one of them. Uh, you know, the, the whole issue is whether there was play for pay or a quid pro quo involved in that. That's where the potential criminality is. I can tell you that, you know, the committee that approved that, I think, got the policy all wrong, but that was policy, a policy decision. Criminality, you know, is whether there was play for pay or a quid pro quo involved, and that's what justice is looking into. So they're looking into it now. <clears throat> By the way, I, you know, I did bring a list of law with me, you know, on what some Wisconsin-based corporations have done, you know, since the corporate tax rate went down to 21. AT and T, a thousand dollar bonuses to 200 thousand employees, and an increase in capital expenditures, which should create more jobs. Associated Bank, $500 employee bonuses, uh, and their base wage raises from $10 to $15 an hour. Comcast, $1,000 bonuses to 100,000 employees, and a $50 billion investment in infrastructure, you know, in the next five years. You know, that's going to make the internet better and faster. Nationwide insurance, $1,000 bonuses to 29,000 employees. Increased 401k matching contribution for 33,000 employees. U.S. Bank Corp. Thousand dollar bonuses for 60,000 employees. Base wage hike to $15 an hour. And then we saw American Family yesterday in the paper. 
and this is just what's happening in Wisconsin, you know, based corporations. You know, we've seen Apple repatriating $380 billion of money they kept overseas because our repatriation tax was so high. That's going to be about $38 billion more in tax revenue that we never would have gotten you know, at the higher rate. So the economy is doing well, and this tax uh, uh, law is going to make it do better, in my opinion. And Congressman, you've been around a long time. You remember when Reagan had his tax cuts and what happened to your revenues in Washington, too. You know, and everybody who was complaining about Reagan's tax cut was complaining about the deficit. The individual income tax collections in the 10 years after Reagan's tax cut doubled. People were making more money, they were paying more tax, unemployment went down, there were more jobs you know, available, people were leaving uh, the unemployment roles and receiving benefits and starting to get jobs and pay taxes. And even when Kennedy did that, uh, back in the 1960s, the same thing happened. You know, what Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump have done was originally thought of by John F. Kennedy. You don't hear that very often. Thank you. <coughs> well, it is now 8.20. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I said the first part of the meeting would last about an hour and a half, and it has. If anybody has got an individual problem with a government agency, uh, complaint window for state agencies there, for federal agencies here, uh, please come on up. Uh, again, I said at the beginning of the meeting, this is the time for people to talk to me one-on-one -on -one and not to continue the general issues part of the meeting. And I would point out that any kind of recording or video taking of this part of the meeting is prohibited.